All right, so here we are, video number five in our series on Heidegger's pretty important essay, pretty inf influential essay, The Origin of the Work of Art. And we're going to recap a little bit here. This, this slide we covered at the end of the last video. Um, but just to sort of pick up where we left off, let's just go ahead and dive right in. Uh, we're going to get into, uh, finally, uh, uh, a bit of an understanding, better understanding of what Heidegger means by world and earth. We're going to save most of that for the next video, um, but we're going to at least get started on that now. And there's going to be a bit further uh, evidence, criticism, argument from him against this representational view of art that he already attacked before. We talked about that in the previous lecture. You know, for him, again, artworks aren't a representation. They're not a copy of something in the world. But actually, for what the work is, is what it does, right? The work, according to Heidegger, is the happening of truth, right? Um, sorry, sorry. The happening of truth is at work in the work of art, right? And that's what makes it a work. So now we have to ask the question of truth, this is the quote, with a view to the work. In order to become more familiar with what the question involves, it's necessary to make visible once more the happening of truth in the work. For this attempt, let us deliberately select a work that cannot be ranked as representational art. So this is the Greek temple passage, okay? Obviously, a Greek temple, a temple would fail the test of that theory of art if it says all art is representational. What does this temple represent? It's a temple. It's a place of worship, or it was a place of worship for the ancient Greek. So how is it that, you know, as, as Heidegger puts it, how is it that truth happens? How is truth at work in this work? Well, let's read. Let's see where he goes with this. A building, a Greek temple, portrays nothing, right? So it's not representational. It simply stands there in the middle of the rock cleft valley. The building encloses the figure of the God. And in this concealment lets it stand out in the holy precinct through the open portico. By means of the temple, the God is present in the temple. This presence of the God is in itself the extension and the delimitation of the precinct as a holy precinct. The temple and its precinct, however, do not fade away into the indefinite. It is the temple work that first fits together and at the same time gathers around itself the unity of those paths and relations in which birth and death, disaster and blessing, victory and disgrace, endurance and decline acquire the shape of destiny for human being. The all-governing expanse of this open relational context is the world of this historical people. Only from, from and in this expanse does the nation first return to itself for the fulfillment of its vocation. Now, all this is very vague for those of you who are not familiar already with Heidegger's work, but if you do know Heidegger, <clears throat> if you've you know, read him before, you're familiar with some of his work from Being in Time, this passage is not quite as obscure as it might seem. So on the face of it, he's just describing a Greek temple. And for many people consider Heidegger an atheist. That's controversial whether he was or not. It's, it's obvious that he was religious early on. He was actually going to school as a rector, to, 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 uh, to become a rector, uh, not a rector, to become a priest. He actually ended up being a rector, a secular position, although that title sounds religious. It was originally a religious title. Uh, but nevertheless, Heidegger, is, you know, his, his religious faith is, is controversial. It's not sure whether he was an atheist or not. Uh, I take him to be atheistic. At least his philosophy is atheistic. He might have, you know, I think one of, the, one of the, these Heidegger scholars that's uh, pretty uh, popular on the internet because he's got a lot of material out there. He's, he's no longer with us, Hubert Dreyfus. Um, you know, he, he claims, I think, that Heidegger was a polytheist. Um, so that's up for debate. But what, what he's saying in this passage, I think, is, is, is most Heidegger scholars don't, don't deny this. He's not saying, when he says that the God is there, 
he's not saying that you know Apollo is real that there's really a god Apollo uh, but what that means to the ancient Greek what a god is right this divine force personified this notion of holiness this this is really there in the temple right if it's anywhere it's there right this is, you know, what, what Christians might call the Holy Spirit. Of course, the Christian will say this is blasphemous. These are demons. You know, pagan Greeks are evil. You know, thank goodness Jesus came to save us, whatever, okay? We're talking about it phenomenologically, right? That's a technical term, but, but that's to say, how was it experienced by the Greeks at the time? And for them, the God was present there. If they were a Greek of faith and they were giving offerings to the, to the God there, the God was really there. That, in fact, the God was more there than when they were just walking around the city and somebody talked about Apollo. Oh, yeah, you better go to the temple. When they were actually there and somber in the, in the middle of their, their ritual, again, um, the God was, was present in the temple. Um, the temple work fits together at the same time, gathers at the unity of the paths and relations in which birth and death Disaster and blessing, victory and disgrace, endurance and decline, acquire the shape of destiny for a human being. The all-governing all expanse of this open relational context is the world of this historical pe people. So this is what he's, he's calling a world. It's an open, open in the sense that there's all sorts of possibilities, relational. It's a relational context, right? So there's all sorts of relations. People have jobs. People have go, to, go to the temple on the weekend or whatever. They go see the theater. This is the world of humans. This is the world that we create. This is where disaster and blessing, victory and disgrace, endurance and decline, they all acqu acquire, as he puts it, the shape of destiny for the human being. They gain significance, right? So this, this as he puts it, this all governing expanse. It's all governing because it gives us any sense of meaning that we have. All meaning we have that we get out of ourselves in the sense of identity, career, job, whatever. It's all a part of this world. The world of, you know, in this sense, it's in this case, this, the world of the Greeks, right? The, the ancient Greeks, this historical people, okay? And it's from this expanse. It's from this world, this open relational context, as he puts it that the nation first returns to itself for the fulfillment of its vocation, right? So that's, you know, that's the sort of the earth, right? So that's the world, right? The world that is revealed in the work. In, in this case, the work is the Greek temple, okay? What else does he say about the temple? Standing there, the building rests on rocky ground. This resting of the work draws up the rock, sorry, draws up out of the rock the mystery of that rock's clumsy yet spontaneous support. Standing there, the building holds its ground against the storm raging above it, and so first makes the storm itself manifest in its violence. The luster and gleam of the stone, though itself apparently glowing only by the grace of the sun, yet first brings to light the light of the day the breadth of the sky, the darkness of the night. The temple's firm towering makes visible the invisible space of air. The steadfastness of the work contrasts with the surge of the surf, and its own repose brings out the raging of the sea. Trees and grass, eagle and bull, snake and cricket, first enter into their distinctive shapes and thus come to appear as what they are. The early Greeks called this emerging and rising in itself, in all things, phusis. It clears and illuminates also that on which and in which man bases his dwelling. We call this ground the earth. What this word says is not to be associated with the idea of a mass of matter, deposited somewhere, or with the merely astronomical idea of a planet. Earth is that whence the arising brings back and shelters everything that arises without violation. In the things that arise, Earth is present as the sheltering agent.
Okay. So in the, in the last passage here, we got a glimpse of world and how the world was brought to the fore in the, in the Greek temple. And world here was an open relational context, right? A governing expanse, the world of humans, right? The world in which we inhabit, where we work and die and, and have fights and politics and all. That's the world, okay? But also the earth. This is the, the, in this passage, we get the, the, the presence of earth in the temple. The temple, as he puts it, rests on rocky ground, earth. The resting of work draws up out of the rock, the mystery of the rock's spontaneous support, earth again. Standing there, the building holds its ground against the storm raging and uh, above it. And so first makes the storm manif manifest in its violence. Because of the stability and the permanence of the structure of the temple, the storm is more manifest in its violence. There's more of a contrast, right? The luster and gleam of the stone, even though, he, as he puts it, is only glowing by the grace of the sun, he wants to say that, it, that that's what first brings the light to the light of the day. It's what lets us see the sun as light and not just as something functional, as something a part of, you know, you know. <clears throat> it's a contrast between <clears throat> the sort of natural elements that we have to deal with, earth, and the structural elements that we inhabit world the temple's firm towering makes visible the invisible space of air right again another stark contrast this open you know endless vast expanse of the air of the sky this is contrasted with the dark sorry with, with the rigid framed pillars of the structure right the steadfastness of the work contrasts with the surge of the surf its own repose brings out the raging sea. Tree and grass, eagle and bull, snake and cricket, they first enter into their distinctive shapes and thus come to appear as what they are. Right? So now they're distinct, they're, they're natural, they're a part of this nature. And, and he, as he mentions here, the early Greeks called this emerging and this rising in itself in all things, phusis, right? So phusis, this is a, there's a close et etymological relation between the word fusis and the English word physics. And in other essays, so I, I, the one that I know for sure Heidegger mentions this is, is the, uh, the age of the world picture. In one of his other essays, you know, he mentions that in different time periods, there were different conceptions of being. And for the early Greeks, things that were, that just had being just in the bare sense were fusis, right? And what that means is they just they just rose, they emerged, they rose out. They saw nature as that which emerges. Okay. So this earth comes out, it juts forth, right? In contradistinction from the stability of the stable structure of the temple, of the work. Right? So the fusis, this this earth clears and illuminates also that on which and in which man bases his dwelling. It's the ground from which the temple is made. We extract the materials from the earth and some of them are appropriate and some are not appropriate. And there's a sort of give and take and a sort of struggle between the work and the earth, but they sort of coalesce, right? So this ground on which the, the earth, sorry, the ground on which the work is, is is set is the earth what this word says like this you know we call this ground the earth what this word says when we call when we say earth it's not just it's not just a matter a massive clump of dirt right oh there's just a bunch of earth over there and we're not talking about just our planet for heidegger this is fusis this is this experience of everything rising out right Earth is that whence the arising brings back and shelters everything that arises without violation. This is very obscure. I think in the next lecture, the next video, we're going to get much deeper into this conception of earth and the conception of world. And I think it'll be a little bit clearer what he means about this sheltering everything and bringing everything back into itself. So, so again, we'll have to keep that sort of an open question. I know it's not very obvious here. 
but he says, in all things that arise, earth is present as the sheltering age. The temple, in its standing there, first gives to things their look and to men their outlook on their on, on themselves. So it gives to things their look. That's sort of the earth jutting forth. It gives to men their outlook on themselves. That's the reflection of the world. That's the setting up of a world in the work. Thinking about, you know, if I'm going to the temple, I'm thinking about, you know, geez, am I being a good, pious citizen of my city? Would Apollo appreciate this, right? It gives me a sort of framework, a, a, a sense of right and wrong, of balance, of meaning in my life. This view remains open as long as the work is a work as long as the God has not fled from it, right? As long as the God still dwells in the temple, as long as people that go to the temple still get that feeling, that they still get that, they're still struck by the power of the divine that they really believe in. So again, the view remains open as long as the work is a work, as long as the God has not fled from it. It's the same with the sculpture of the God, the votive offering of the victor at the Olympic games. It is not a portrait whose purpose is to make it easier to realize how the God looks. Rather, it is a work that lets the God himself be present and thus is the God himself. I think Hindus might appreciate this. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of Hindus, you know, they get, they get criticism from other religions because they're seen as I icon, uh, as idolatrous and there's too much iconography a lot of religions, like especially Islam, is very iconoclast. They don't, they don't think you should worship any images of the divine. But for the Hindu, it's not the actual physical object that is divine. Yeah, it looks like they're worshiping a statue of Ganesh. It looks like they're worshiping a statue of, of – uh, uh, I'm trying to think of another god. Um, uh, sorry, I'm brain dead all of a sudden. I, I know like I'm, there's like 200 million gods in Hindu, and I can only think of Ganesh. Uh, Shiva and you know, Parvati and, 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 and Krishna. There we go. Uh, Vishnu, right? They're not worshiping the statue, right? The statue is just a way of getting them to – almost transporting them – into this holy experience, the spiritual experience where they allow the force of their faith and belief to affect them in a real and significant way, right? So, so again, the God is really there. It's not, it's not just a representation of him. It's the actual God himself. Heidegger says the same holds for the linguistic work. If you're, if you're watching a play, right? In the tragedy, nothing is staged or displayed theatrically but the battle of the new gods against the old is being fought. This is a very obscure line. The, 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 the battle between the old gods and the new gods is being fought. What is he talking about here? If you watch my lectures on Nietzsche, you might think that this is, you know, and, and it, really, it really kind of is echoing Nietzsche and what he says in The Birth of Tragedy. You know, when tragedy was first created in the Greeks, it was a battle of the old and the new gods. The old Olympian gods were given a new form, a more direct, more visceral, kind of an almost nihilistic, uh, but, but yet hopeful at the same time, uh, um, sort of recasting. And so what he's saying here, I take it, is that in art, even in a linguistic work, when you go to see a great work of art, a great play, it's going to make you think about the old gods, in other words, the things that we worship, the things that we hold sacred, the things that we value in society, and start to contemplate new gods. Are there new ways of valuing? Are there new ways of looking at things? Are there new things that we should cherish? So the, so the linguistic work originating in the speech of the people does not refer to this battle. So it's not that, that you watch a play and it's obvious that this is what's going on. It's not didactic in that sense, but it transforms the people saying so that now every living word fights the battle and puts up for decision what is holy and what unholy, what great and what small, what brave and what cowardly, what's lofty and what flighty, what master and what slave. And he refers to Heraclitus's 53rd fragment, you know, Heraclitus, uh, 
I think I mentioned Heraclitus in earlier videos. I, I, in, in, I think in the, in, in the context of Nietzsche, because Nietzsche mentions Heraclitus, um, or maybe it was um, Schopenhauer. Now I'm starting to think it was Schopenhauer. But this, this fragment 53, war is the father of all and king of all. And some he has made gods and some men, some bound and some free. Now there's a way to read this just literally, obviously, yeah. Like, it, you know, back in the day, might makes right. Whoever was strongest and had the best weapons got to make all, call all the shots. But now when we're looking at a work of art, you know, it's, it's a more subtle war, right? It's a psychological war. It's a sort of cultural, social war, right? We see these work of art, if it's a work in Heidegger's sense, if it actually evokes that sort of a response and it makes us sort of question ourselves and think about the world itself as a world and, 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 and the features in it and start to think about the values that, that, that are a part of this open relational context, as he puts it, right? Um, then in a sense, it's also a battle. It's not a physical violent battle, like a war that we're you know, accustomed to thinking about when we think of the, the word, the term war, but it's a battle and we fight it you know, in our, our appreciation, our failure to appreciate art. Uh, if Heidegger sees this as a, a cultural struggle, right? And this is what, this is what art does, you know, great works of art that actually do what, what, what art does. What, 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 a, what a work does, right? what, what, when, it, when it sets the truth to work. So, you know, this also, and I don't know if I want to spend too much time on this, this analysis of the Greek temple for those Heidegger nerds out there. Um, if you want to ever read, I, I highly recommend his other essay, uh, Building, Dwelling, and Thinking. And in that essay, he talks a lot more about building obviously creating things making things and really focuses largely on works of architecture structures buildings that we make but i find that this this passage on the greek temple makes that essay a lot clearer because in that essay again i bet i probably shouldn't spend too much time on this because it's not super super pertinent but in that essay, the, uh, the essay, Building, Dwelling, and Thinking, Heidegger mentions this concept of the fourfold. He says that when a structure is created, he uses the example of a bridge in, in uh, um, oh, geez, where's the town? It's not that important. Uh, uh, but anyways, I can't remember the, the exact bridge, but he says there's a bridge over, I, I want to say Heidelberg, but I know it's not Heidelberg, some old German town, right? The bridge, you know, for him, it makes space for earth, sky, man, and God. So, you know, earth, obviously, it's built on earth, right? It, it's, it's there to sort of help us on our way through earth. It's, you know, it's made from earth. The sky is, is, is opened up and allowed, right? As he puts it here in the Greek temple, the sky, as he put it, um, the temple's firm towering makes visible the invisible space of air. Um, <clears throat> there's also the gods, right? Obviously in the temple, the God is present, right? There's this sort of holiness. And obviously man is housed in there in our concerns with world, right? Uh, and you know, for Heidegger, what happens in the work is a sort of setting up of a world, right? The work sets, when we set up a work and it really works, and we're talking about works of art here, what that really means for him, and, and this also ties into the, the uh, setting up of truth or the happening of truth in art, but when we set up a work of art, when we create a work of art, for Heidegger, if it's really truly a work, it sets up a world. So let's read this long quote here. I think we actually have time to get through this quote. We're going to save most of this analysis on what it means to set up a world. And also he says that the work sets forth the earth. We're going to have to kind of save most of that analysis for the next lecture, right? But let's read this quote. Let's go over the next couple slides here. And then we'll be in a really good position to sort of really start the next video on this concept of world, talk about earth, how they relate, what it means to set up a world, what it means to set forth the earth. 
But let's start here again. This is where he first starts to introduce this concept here, what it means to set up a work and set up a world through a work. When a work is brought into a collection or placed in an exhibition, we also say that it's set up. But this setting up differs essentially from setting up in the sense of erecting a building, raising a statue, presenting a tragedy at a holy festival. Such setting up is erecting in the sense of dedication and praise. Here, setting up no longer means a bare placing. So he thinks, you know, if you put a work in a collection or an exhibition, this is a bare placing. Not so in erecting a building, raising a statue, presenting a tragedy, holy festival, right? This is erecting in the sense of dedication and praise. To dedicate means to consecrate in the sense that in setting up the work, the holy is opened up as holy and the god is invoked into the openness of his presence praise belongs to dedication as doing honor to the dignity and splendor of the god dignity and splendor are not properties beside and behind which the god too stands as something distinct but it is rather in the dignity in the splendor that the God is present. In the reflected glory of this, this splendor, there glows, in other words, there lightens itself what we call the word. To erect means to open the right in the sense of a guiding measure, a form in which what belongs to the nature of a being gives guidance. Let's pause there. Let's reread that. So to erect, right, in this sense, right, to set up, what that means is to open the right in the sense of a guiding measure, a form in which what belongs to the nature of being gives guidance. Okay, that's a mouthful there. What does it do? It means to open the right. Okay, what is, what is right? What's correct? What is, what is good? What's a guide? Okay, open the right in the sense of a guiding measure, some form in which what belongs to the nature of being gives guidance, right? There's a form, a work of art, a piece, whatever, that sort of belongs to the nature of a certain being, think about Van Gogh's shoes, and gives us a certain guidance, tells us something about the world in which we inhabit, makes us think about it. But why is the setting up of a work and erecting that consecrates and praises? Because the work, in its work being, demands it. How is it that the work comes to demand such a setting up? Because it itself, in its own work being, is something that sets up. Well, what does the work, as work, set up? Towering up within itself, the work opens up a world and keeps it abidingly in force. I keep saying that he's, you know, the work sets up a world, but to be technical, it opens up a world is, is, is how Heidegger likes to put it. It opens up a world. The work opens up just the way that, you know, Van Gogh's painting opened up a world of the peasant to us. It let us kind of think about what is it like to wear these shoes? What is it like to, to plow the fields? to get home from work at the end of the day and take these shoes off and set them there at the, the, next to the door, right? The work opened up that world to us, right? So that's what the work does. That's, that's the work being of the work. That's exactly what it does, and that's how it does it. Right? Opens up a world. So setting up a work in a collection, it's different, right? It's, 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 it's not the same as the setting up in a sense of a dedication and a praise, right? To, to erect in this sense, to set up in this sense, means to, as he puts it, to open up the right, in, in German, richt, right? Uh, what is correct, the measure which guides us along, and that which is essential and gives its guidance. So the work being, as he puts it, of the work, 
demands a kind of consecration and praise, right? You know, we, 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 uh, <clears throat> it makes us stand back and, and, and see it and, and reflect. And so be, this is for him because um, in its work being, right, the fact that it is a work, what makes it a work, is that it sets this up. That is what makes it a, a work. Rising up from within itself, the work opens up a world and keeps it abiding in force, right? So to be a work for him, this, this is the work character of work. To be a work means to set up a world. And what the heck is a world? We've already kind of talked about that a little bit. I see that I still have time here. I think we're only about 34 minutes in. Should I read this? No, I don't think I should because this is a good place to start the next lecture on. So that's what I'm going to do. The next, the next lecture, we're really going to get into world, what it means to set up, and also talking a bit more about setting forth and what, a, what the earth is. We'll talk more about the earth and kind of elaborate on that and how world and earth fit together how they come together, how they're sort of unified and brought forth or opened up, to use his language, in a work of art, right? So we're going to leave all of that for this next video. I thank you guys for sticking around uh, to the end of this one. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover, still a lot more to cover, but we're getting pretty darn close to the end here. Uh, but the end of it gets pretty dense, right? So it's still quite a few videos to cover, but we really get to the nitty gritty of the origin of the work of art and what it really means to work and what an origin is and what this has to do with truth. This is what gets pretty, really difficult to follow, pretty deep stuff. Um, but I think it's pretty fruitful and illuminating, pretty thought provoking. So as always, thanks for sticking around till the end here. And I hope to see you on the other side. Cheers.